So today is chapter seven of The Giver, and um, I'll start reading for you. I hope you enjoyed chapter six with Mr. Templeton yesterday. Now, Jonas's group had taken a new place in the auditorium, trading with the new eleven, so that they sat in the very front, immediately before the stage. They were arranged by their original numbers, the numbers they had been given at birth. The numbers were rarely used after the naming, but each child knew his number, of course. Sometimes parents used them in irritation at a child's misbehaviour, indicating that mischief made one unworthy of a name. Jonas always chuckled when he heard a parent, exasperated, call sharply to a whining toddler. That's enough, 23. Jonas was 19. He'd been the 19th new child born this year. It had meant that at his naming, he'd already been standing and bright-eyed, soon to walk and talk. It had given him a slight advantage the first year or two, a little more maturity than many of his groupmates who'd been born in the later months of that year, but it evened out, as it always did, by three. After three, the children progressed at much the same level, though by their first number one could always tell he was a few months older than others in his group. Technically, Jonas's full number was 1119, since there were other 19s, of course, in each age group. And today, now that the new 11s had been advanced this morning, there were two 1119s. At the midday break, he had exchanged smiles with the new one, a shy female named Harriet. But the duplication was only for these few hours. Very soon, he would not be an 11, but a 12, an age would no longer matter. He would be an adult like his parents, though a new one and untrained still. Asher was four and sat now in the row ahead of Jonas. He would have received his assignment fourth. Fiona, 18, was on his left. On his other side sat 20, a male named Pierre, whom Jonas didn't like much. Pierre was very serious, not much fun, and a warrior and a tattletale too. Have you checked the rules, Jonas? Pierre was always whispering solemnly. I'm not sure that's within the rules. Usually it was some foolish thing that no one cared about, opening his tunic if it was a day with a breeze, taking a brief, brief try on a friend's bicycle just to experience the different feel of it. The initial speech at the ceremony of 12 was made by the chief elder, the leader of the community who was elected every 10 years. The speech was much the same each year, recollection of the time of childhood and the period of preparation, the coming responsibilities of adult life, the profound importance of assignment, the seriousness of training to come. Then the chief elder moved ahead in her speech. This is the time, she began looking directly at them, when we acknowledge differences. You 11s have spent all your years till now learning to fit in, to standardise your behaviour, to curb any impulse that might set you apart from the group. But today, we honour your differences. They have determined your futures. She began to describe this year's group and its variety of personalities, though she singled no one out by name. She mentioned that there was one who had singular skills at caretaking, another who loved new children, one with unusual scientific aptitude, and a fourth for whom physical labour was an obvious pleasure. Jonas shifted in his seat, trying to recognise each reference as one of his groupmates. The catering skills were no doubt those of Fiona on his left. He remembered noticing the tenderness with which she'd bathed the old. Probably the one with scientific aptitude was Benjamin, the male who had devised new important equipment for the rehabilitation centre. He had heard nothing that he recognised as himself, Jonas. Finally, the chief elder paid tribute to the hard work of her committee, which had performed the observation so meticulously all year. The committee of elders stood and was acknowledged by applause. Jonas noticed Asher yawned slightly, covering his mouth politely with his hand. Then at last the chief elder called number one to the stage, and the assignments began. Each announcement was, length, was lengthy, accompanied by speech directed at the new twelve. Jonas tried to pay attention as one, smiling happily, received her assignment as fish hatchery attendant, along with words of praise for her childhood spent doing many volunteer hours there and her obvious interest in the important process of providing nourishment for the community. Number one, her name was Madeline, returned finally, amidst applause to her seat, wearing a new badge that designated her fish hatchery attendant. Jonas was certainly glad that that assignment was taken. He wouldn't have wanted it. He gave Madeline a smile of congratulation. When too, a female named Inga received her assignment as birth mother, 
Jonas remember, remembered that his mother had called it a job without honour, but he thought the committee had chosen well. Inga was a nice girl, though somewhat lazy, and her body was strong. She would enjoy the three years of being pampered that would follow her brief training. She would give birth easily and well, and the task of labour that would follow would use her strength and keep her healthy and impose self-discipline. Inga was smiling when she resumed her seat. Birth mother was an important job, if lacking in prestige. Jonas noticed that Asher looked nervous. He kept turning his head and glancing back at Jonas until the group leader had to give him a silent chastisement, a motion to sit still and face forward. Three, Isaac was given an assignment as instructor of sixes, which obviously pleased him and was well deserved. Now there were three assignments gone, none of the ones that Jonas would have liked, not that he could have been a birth mother anyway, he realised with amusement. He had tried to sort through the list in his mind, the possible assignments that remained, but there were so many he gave it up. And anyway, now it was Ash's turn. He paid strict attention as his friend went to the stage and stood self-consciously beside the chief elder. All of us in the community know and enjoy Asher, the chief elder began. Asher grinned and scratched one leg with the other foot and the audience chuckled softly. When the committee began to consider Asher's assignment, she went on, there were some possibilities that were immediately discarded, some that would clearly have not been right for Asher. For example, she said smiling, we did not consider for an instant designating Asher an instructor of threes. The audience howled with laughter and Asher laughed too, looking sheepish but pleased at the special attention. The instructors of threes were in charge of the acquisition of correct language. In fact, the chief elder continued, chuckling a little herself, we even gave a little thought to some retroactive chastisement for the one who had been Asher's instructor of threes so long ago. At the meeting where Asher was discussed, we retold many of the stories that we all remembered from his days of language acquisition. Especially, she said, chuckling, the difference between snack and smack. Remember, Asher? Asher nodded ruefully and the audience laughed loud. Jonas did too. He remembered, though he had been only three at the time himself. The punishment used for small children was a regulated system of smacks with a discipline wand, a thin, flexible weapon that stung painfully when it wielded. The childcare specialists were trained very carefully in the discipline methods, a quick smack across the hands for a bit of minor misbehaviour, three sharper smacks on the bare legs for a second offence. Poor Asher, who always talked too fast and mixed up words even as a toddler. As a three, eager for his juice and crackers at snack time, he one day said smack instead of snack, as he stood waiting in line for the morning treat. Jonas remembered it clearly. He could still see little Asher wiggling with impatience in the line. He remembered the cheerful voice call out, I want my snack. The other threes, including Jonas, had laughed nervously. Snack, they corrected. You meant snack, Asher. But the mistake had been made, and precision of language was one of the most important tasks of small children. Asher had asked for a snack. The discipline wand in the hand of the childcare worker whistled as it came down across Asher's hand. Asher whimpered, cringed and cracked himself instantly. Snack, he whispered. But the next morning he had done it again, and again the following week. He couldn't seem to stop, though for each lapse the discipline wand came again, escalating to a series of painful lashes that left mark on Asher's legs. Eventually, for a period of time, Asher stopped talking altogether when he was a three. For a while, the chief elder said, relating the story, we had a silent Asher, but he learned. She turned to him with a smile. When he began to talk again, it was with great precision, and now his lapses are very few. His corrections and apologies are very prompt, and his good humour is unfailing. The audience murmured in agreement. Asher's cheerful disposition was well known throughout the community. Asher, she lifted her voice to make the official announcement, we have given you... The assignment of Assistant Director of Recreation. She clicked on his new badge as he stood beside her, beaming. Then he turned and left the stage as the audience cheered. When he had taken his seat again, the chief elder looked down at him and said the words that she had said now four times and would say to each new twelve. Somehow she gave it special meaning for each of them. Asha, she said, thank you for your childhood. The assignments continued and Jonas watched and listened, 
relieved now by the wonderful assignment his best friend had been given. But he was none and more apprehensive as his own approached. Now the new twelves in the row ahead had all received their badges. They were fingering them as they sat, and Jonas knew that each one was thinking about the training that lay ahead. For some, one studious male had been selected as doctor, a female as engineer, and another for law and justice. It would be years of hard work and study. Others, like labourers and birth mothers, would have a much shorter training period. Eighteen, Fiona on his left was called. Jonas knew she must be nervous, but Fiona was a calm female. She had been sitting quietly and serenely throughout the ceremony. Even the applause, though enthusiastic, seemed serene when Fiona was given the important assignment of caretaker of the old. It was perfect for such a sensitive girl, and her smile was satisfied and pleased when she took her seat beside him again. Jonas prepared himself to walk to the stage when the applause ended, and the chief elder picked up the next folder and looked down to the group to call forward the next twelve. He was calm now that his turn had come. He took a deep breath and smoothed his hair with his hand. Twenty, he heard her voice say clearly. Pierre, she, she skipped me, Jonas thought stunned. Had he heard wrong? No. There was a sudden hush in the crowd, and he knew that the entire community realised that the chief elder had moved from 18 to 20, leaving a gap. On his right, Pierre, with a startled look, rose from his seat and moved to the stage. A mistake. She made a mistake. But Jonas knew, even as he had the thought that she hadn't. The chief elder had made no mistakes, not at the ceremony of twelve. He felt dizzy and couldn't focus his attention. He didn't hear what assignment Pierre received and was only dimly aware of the applause as the boy returned wearing his new badge. Then, 21, 22, the numbers continued in order. Jonas sat days as they moved into the 30s and then the 40s, nearing the end. Each time, at each announcement, his heart jumped for a moment and he thought wild thoughts. Perhaps now she would call his name. Could he have forgotten his own number? No, he'd always been 19. He was sitting in the seat marked 19, but she had skipped him. He saw the others in his group glance at him, embarrassed and then avert their eyes quickly. He saw a worried look on the face of his group leader. He hunched his shoulders and tried to make himself smaller in the seat. He wanted to disappear, to fade away, not to exist. He didn't dare to turn and find his parents in the crowd. He couldn't bear to see their faces darken with shame. Jonas bowed his head and searched through his mind. What had he done wrong? I hope you enjoyed chapter seven and um, I hope that you tune in for chapter eight tomorrow to find out what Jonas has done wrong and what assignment he has been allocated. Thank you for listening.